Well, good evening, everyone. And um, thank you for joining us for Behind Old Ireland in Colour with Professor John Breslin. My name is Joy Carey and I'm the Prony Digitization Manager. Um, and like all of you tonight, because you've joined this, this uh, session, I'm very interested in historic photographs and their ability to visually transport us back in time. So before I hand you over to John, there's just a couple of housekeeping announcements that I've been asked to make. Um, I would like to make everyone aware that we're being recorded this evening. So if you would prefer not to be visible in the recording, please, could you turn your camera off? Also, everyone apart from the speakers have been muted on entry. So that's just to avoid background noises. So if you can please use the chat function if you have any questions for John at the end. Um, as you're all interested in the history of photography, I'd like to invite you to visit Prony before Friday the 7th of April if you can. Our current exhibition is an artist's eye photography of Mary Alice Young of Galgorm Castle. And there's 100 photographs from this Prony collection dating from 1890s to 1920s in show in the atrium of our building here in Belfast, along with some archival material as well from the, the Galgorm papers. So now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor John Breslin researches and teaches electronic engineering at the University of Gal Galway. He's also the co-author of the bestsellers Old Ireland in Colour, books one and two, which are co-authored with Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley. Um, and so over to you, John. Thank you very much, Joy, and uh, it's great to be here this evening. And thanks to yourself for the kind invite, Joy, and also thanks to Grace for all her help in getting ready for, um, for the talk this evening. And I'm going to go straight into presentation mode and hopefully you can all see this okay. Great. So, um, you know, I won't say too much about myself, but basically I, uh, I'm an academic at the University of Galway. Um, I do research in diverse areas. Um, I was talking earlier on to um, Joy and Grace about my work in the area of the semantic web, which is kind of related to metadata and photographs and archival um, items have a lot of metadata associated with them. So I have kind of a, an interest in, in, in that side of things as well. Um, I've been involved in the startup space and I'm involved in uh, an effort called the Galway City Innovation District, which is basically a startup um, hub, a uh, set of buildings here in Galway City for, for tech startups. And as Joy mentioned, the co-author of All Iron and Colour, and I will tell you a little bit more about how that happened. So my whole interest in the area of colorization started with a tweet from a, actually from a semantic web researcher that I follow on Twitter, a guy called Dan Brickley, he, he works for Google. And he shared out some tweet about this new system called the Oldify. Um, so the Oldify kind of does what the name suggests. It basically takes old photographs and makes them look anew. And I tried out, actually, I think, I think the first thing I tried out was on a video because you can actually colorize uh, videos quite easily using uh, the Oldify. And I took a, an old British Pate video of Galway and ran it through the Oldify and I just thought the results were uh, amazing. And after that, I just you know tried a couple more photographs around Galway from County Clare, where I'm from. And I just shared them out on my own um, social media channel. And there was great reaction to, to, um, to seeing this, uh, these pictures in, in, in color, many of them for, for the first time. So that same year, I was actually fortunate enough to meet the creators of the Oldify. It was made by a programmer, a researcher called Jason Antic. And um, Jason was taking a course in artificial intelligence called Fast AI, and he basically had to do a project. And the project he picked was automatic colorization of black and white photographs. And he took, took it on and created the, the Oldify platform as a result. So I was actually over in the States for, for a board meeting, and I met up with um, Jason and also his colleague, Dana Kelly, who joined him on, on the Oldify project. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how it works, but at a high level, like we've heard lots of talk about deep learning at the moment, mainly because of chat GPT, which uh, people are familiar with for various reasons. And chat GPT and other systems are being powered by an artificial intelligence um, framework or set of technologies, mainly called deep learning. And how the Oldify works is it essentially is given a set of black and white images and the color version. So actually what, what happens is, uh, a full set of color photographs is provided. They are converted into black and white. And then the system is trained to learn a mapping between the black and white image and its color version. And then it starts to understand that when it's given a 
new black and white image that certain types of things should be certain colors based on what it's seen before. So to learn, learn from all of these black and white and color mappings or twins, whatever you want to call them, and then it uses that to basically colorize new unseen images. And that might be on different types of things. It might be on the shapes or the textures or you know um, certain patterns that it encounters in the black and white and color uh, images it's been trained on. So then when it sees a new black and white image, it's able to add color to that based on its model. The whole deep learning thing, as I mentioned, is, you know, of course, it's really very much in the news in the past um, couple of months with, with ChatGPT, but also other systems for generating uh, images. There's um, a whole emerging uh, set of technologies around um, image generation based on textual prompts where you type in something, say, you know, um, I typed in last year when uh, Liz Trust made some comment about turnip farmers in Ireland. I typed in Liz Trust uh, holding turnips, and of course, generates generates a whole set of images of, of Liz Trust and some turnips. Um, so, the deep learning revolution. It's it's interesting. This is a book actually from a couple of years ago, but the whole idea is that computers are being um, uh, basically given uh, models that are replicating or mimicking the way the brain works in, in terms of neurons. And it's really a bit like as well the internet revolution, the deep learning revolution has come about because of the fact that computing power has become so so powerful. This stuff has been predicted for years and you know there's a bit of text here talking about how it works. But the interesting thing I think was that people have been talking about this for about you know 40, 50 years, but it's just that at a certain point in time the computing power became so so powerful that you're now able to create these neural networks on computers that allow us to do these amazing things as we see with um, GPT and so on. And the person predicted it was going to happen around 2015, which it kind of did. A lot of these deep learning frameworks run on uh, systems that were often made for playing computer games, GPUs they're called. So like if you have any kids or grandkids or nephews or cousins who play do a lot of gaming, they're likely using um, a high powered computer that uses a graphical processing unit. And a lot of these deep learning systems like the old file and so on run on these um soft on these computing systems that have billions of processors so it's just that the technology has advanced to such a point that this stuff can be done very very quickly once it has learned an, an appropriate model um the old file runs in a, a system called a gan now there's lots of colorization frameworks i'll mention some, some of them later on but this particular one uses something called uh, a gan and what happens is something colorizes a picture and then it goes to another system that basically criticizes and says if it's good, it's good or bad and if it's bad it goes back again and it tries to produce a better model so it's kind of like almost two types of computer systems that are saying you know here's a colorization that says yeah it's good or it's bad and it criticizes and then it goes in and tries to improve it proves it if, if it's not good so it's a it's a unique type of system that basically results in better automatic colorizations um, but as I said, you can run this on a on a kind of a standard gaming computer. And I had a, a PC here in my my office, um, which unfortunately has now broken down. But I was able to basically throw loads of black and white pictures at it from you know ones I just downloaded from Flickr, public domain ones and so on. And it was basically colorizing a picture every second or so. So I've done you know twenty thousand images in the matter of a couple of hours just by firing it at this the Oldify colorization system running on my PC. So it just shows you how kind of powerful this is. And you can imagine doing this for, for videos, black and white videos, same kind of thing. Videos are made up of frames. It's usually 30 frames per second. So you can imagine, you know, how many frames, how many, you know, uh, minutes of video could you do if you could do 20,000 images in a few hours? Well, how, how many minutes of video could you do using the same kind of system as well? So that's the kind of the technology side of things. So I have some researchers working on trying to improve colorization, in particular video colorization. One of my students, a guy called Rory, is working on basically trying to stop flickering in colorized video. And he's got a project called vid to color which is uh, funded by Science Foundation Ireland. And if you're interested in that, you can click on this link or ask me and I can send you more details again at any stage. An important point, though, is that it's not just AI. And your AI is a great base framework to get a certain level of colorization, but it only gets you so far. and I did a video, uh, I think it was last year, about the process involved in colorization. There's just a huge amount of research into the image, into what's going on, into typical closed colors of the time. And um, if you are uh, interested in, in, in seeing some of this, this video, which I did about uh, a colorization of um, the Doyle uh, picture shown here, 
basically kind of illustrates a bit about that. And it's a particularly, you know, interesting picture because there's lots of famous people in it, but there's also a lot of detail in it. There's all these paintings in the background. There's, um, there, as you can see, there are kind of red hands in the middle uh, over the picture of Parnell. Um, so what I found out when I looked at this picture was that, and by the way, there have been lots of colorizations of this, and there'd be lots of, there have been lots of paintings of this as well, who had painted kind of the scene. Um, but many of the paintings were painted after the events that happened, like maybe you know 20 years afterwards. So there, there was no kind of definitive record of what were the colors of the tablecloth or the, the drapes and so on. But what I was able to find was the paintings that were in the background. And it turned out that all the paintings in this room, which paintings are no longer there, turned out to be uh, paintings of Lord Mayors of Dublin. And I found this book, which is the Dublin, Dublin Civic Portrait Collection. I was able to basically go through it, extract all the paintings and use those paintings as the color colors for the paintings in the background there of, of that pic picture. So um, that was one thing. And then behind the paintings, I noticed there were coats of arms. And you can see all these labels there on the screen for you know different names, Carol and Parton and so on. So the coats of arms were coats of arms for the mayors of Dublin. So I went through all of the coats of arms to try and find you know what was the color of the heraldry and applies those colors to all the coats of arms in the background. Some of them are, are only partially visible behind those paintings, but you get the idea in terms of the kind of work you're trying to do to figure out anything that you might be able to find knowledge on, on in terms of the colors. In, in, in the picture. Now, of course, it's never going to be exactly as it was. There's lots of guesswork. You're making, um, you know, guesses of things that look right or that would seem right in terms of clothing of the time. You know, I have a book here on, on, on dress in Ireland, which I keep consulting again and again by Murray Dunleavy, which kind of goes through different eras in, in Ireland and kind of the types of, of dyes and clothing that were worn at different points in time. There's lots of records, there's folklore records and so on in terms of the dyes people use at certain points in time. It kind of gets you so far and this, you know, it, it, it's, it probably gives you an indication of the palette, let's say, of colors that might be used at a certain point in time, but it's by no means um, going to be ever 100%, uh, um, probably even 50% might be a, a stretch for, for, for many pictures, but you're trying to get something that looks realistic and um, that you could imagine would be representative of, of, of the time. So, this is a picture actually I was working on, two pictures I was working on today for, for a project. And uh, I just wanted to kind of show you, I suppose, what can be done. So I started working on these this morning and I finished them this afternoon. The picture on the left-hand side is of Bernard Bracken. So Bernard Bracken was a Tipperary man, but he's best known as the, uh, actually, I think his father was one of the co-founders of the GAA, but he went to, uh, I think he was an MP actually at one stage, but he, he became Churchill's spin doctor essentially during, uh, during and around uh, World War II. And the picture on the left is uh, Bernard Bracken. It's from the Imperial War Museum originally, but it's on Wikimedia Commons as well um, uh, under Crown Copyright. Um, and the people in the picture are Bernard Bracken on the left-hand side. There is um, a general in the, in the middle and on the right-hand side, there is Mary Churchill, uh, Churchill's daughter. So that was one picture in terms of, well, I can probably find out, you know, uh, Mary Churchill or Mary Soames as she became her hair color. Bernard Bracken, there's lots of records of his red hair. You, when you have soldiers, it does actually make the job a little bit easier because there's always certain known uniforms, there's certain, you know, stripes, there's certain colors on, on, on the lapels and so on. But I did have a lot of fun trying to figure out what kind of colors were on his ribbon, you know, ribbons which designate the various campaigns that, that he was on. And I'll show you what my, my result is in a minute. On the right hand side, we have pictures that that picture on the, on the left is, I, I believe it's 1943, because that's when Churchill and Mary Churchill were in, in the US. He went to the US five times during World War II. I've learned a lot today that I didn't know um, before today about um, about about Churchill and, and, and his visits to the US. But anyway, that picture was taken, I believe it was taken in Canada because um, there is a magazine being held by Mary Churchill, which is New World magazine, which was published in Canada. So that's my best guess. Picture on the right is of the infamous Lord Ha Ha, who also has Irish connections. Um, you can only see his head, uh, disembodied head, kind of floating down there in the bottom left of the picture. Did everybody just zoomed in on a particular part with the soldiers? But again, uh, he was captured by the um, by by the army, and he was brought to the Second Army headquarters in 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 Germany. And small things like you know the little lapel on on the person's sleeve. I was trying to figure out well, what color should that be? Um, you know, there's always the kind of the standard sort of khaki colors for for uh, British uniforms, but in terms of 
you know, the various small features like the lapel and so on, what color should that be? I found out the second army has a certain color. So anyway, that's the black and white version. And here are the two uh, colorized versions that I finished off today. So we've Brian Bracken on the left-hand side with his, his red hair. We have um, Mary Churchill. I actually found some copies, not that particular copy of the New World magazine, but I found other issues and they all have this red text at the top, a uh, black and white photograph. So I was fairly comfortable that that was uh, representative of, of, of the image. Um, the general, General Hastings, I think is May Hastings is, is the person in the middle. He had this big ribbon. Now, during World War II, there were a number of color photographs taken and you'll have seen various bits of footage and, and imagery probably from World War II. And I found various pictures of, of um, Hastings with ribbons, but none of them matched up to what was in this black and white picture. So um, he normally was wearing three lines of ribbons. And eventually I figured out that the ri ribbons had been sort of moved around onto two lines instead of three lines. And I was able to line up the colored ribbons to the black and white ribbons. I could see where the lines actually lined up. And I was very, and, and then I was able to chop off parts and move them onto the second line. So it was very, you know, uh, interesting kind of puzzle solving, but also um, a bit strange in terms of uh, what, what I went to try to figure out what kind of campaign ribbons he, he was wearing. Uh, and then on the on, on the right side, as I mentioned, the uh, the second company soldiers with their you know their little lapel and the rest of the stuff was, was kind of fairly standard after that. Uh, again, I found it a little bit difficult to find information on William Joyce or Lord Haw Haw in terms of his, his eye color and hair color, but eventually I tracked down an interview that described his mouse colored hair and his piercing blue eyes, and I was able to kind of go with that. So that's where the picture came from. So a lot of the success around Old Iron and Colour was really around the social media channels that I set up in um, 2019. So I told you that I started sharing a couple of colorized pictures on, on my own social media account. And after a while, while it became so popular, I said, I need to set up a kind of a, a dedicated identity for this, which is uh, which I called Old Ireland and Colour. And, um, you know, it's, it just kind of took off. So, of course, then after that, we had the... Um, the whole COVID thing. And in, in March, 2020, I was like many people at home, but I'd, been, I'd, I'd still been sharing out colorized photographs and people were saying, you know, you should really try and do a book on this. There was a couple of examples of, of colorization books like Color of Time and so on. So I just looked through, you know, again, I'm, I'm not, I have to admit, I'm not, I wasn't a history buff. I knew very little really, to be honest, about history. I hadn't done history since 1988 in school. And a lot of it was kind of a distant memory, but, I was starting to learn bits and pieces, but I knew that I needed to um, collaborate with a, a true historian. And I reached out to a colleague, Sarah Ann, who I hadn't met before, but I sent an email to her. Uh, I went through the list of academics in our history department and I found Sarah Ann's expertise just seemed to line up exactly to the uh, topic of, of the book. Reached out and she said yes. And the, the, uh, the story went from there. And interestingly, Sarah Ann and I did not meet for, what was it? And anyway, we wrote the two books together without actually having met. Um, so it was August, I think, 2021 before we actually met. And we, we you know, the second book was already in print at, at, at that stage. So um, I suppose it shows what can be done over Zoom and uh, and virtually as well. But um, anyway, uh, we went on to sell you know many uh, copies. And I think it's something like 120, 140,000 copies at this stage uh, between the two books. But, you know, the sales are great, but the stories, I think, are, are even more interesting. And... I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, the Galway City Innovation District, or Porter Shed, as we call it, which is our startup hub. And the CEO of the, start, the, the Porter Shed, um, Mary Rogers, had sent a copy of the book to her brother in New York. And her brother shared out a picture of the, uh, of the book on his bookshelf. And a friend of his said, uh, saw the picture on Facebook and said, oh my God, that's my mother. So he recognized the picture of his mother. The picture is in the, it's, it's around kind of late 1930s, early 1940s. And it turned out that um, his mother is this girl here, um, Kathleen, who is shown here on the bottom left of the picture. So um, then two more two more of the children from the picture were identified. Uh, we have Eileen, who's in um, Chicago. And then there is um, uh, Sean, who's in, in County Kerry. So, of course, it was, it was uh, just fun to get them to hold the help copy of the book with, with of course, themselves uh, colorized on, on the cover. And later on, for our second book, when that came out, we found out the names of the two boys on, on the cover of that book. And that's on the, the top um, top right there of, of the screen. So um, it's been interesting to kind of hear, I suppose, the impact as well that it's had on people, you know, because 
we've had lots of coverage. Both myself and Sarah have been on television on the Late Late Show uh, talking about book one and book two. People have, um, you know, done their own paintings or um, poems or just been inspired, I suppose, by the pictures in the book. There's, um, uh, it, it, I can't talk about it yet, but let's say a very big animation studio who is producing a um, animation for a, a very well-known brand have cited Old Iron Colour as inspiration for some of their, their work. It's just great to hear kind of how it's inspired people to do things in, in different domains. This is a sketch that um, Roisin Cure did up, about up the two boys on, on, on the cover, and it's just fun to see what, how people interpret it in different ways. But I think it's the impact on people in terms of connecting families together. Um, a friend of mine, his, um, his brother-in-law um, is quite, has been quite unwell for many years, has, you know, uh, kind of retreated into himself um, quite a lot and was given a copy of the book and every day used to just open up the book and flick through it and just, you know, was just really taken by it. And I've heard so many stories of, you know, elderly people uh, connecting with grandchildren, talking about stories of, you know, when they were young and, and uh, kind of using the book to kind of uh, do that. It's just been very ins inspiring. And also to hear about people who either have family members or um, relations in the book. Like when I was on the, the Late Day Show um, picture, I'm kind of moving my mouse around at the moment, the um, great grandson of, of that uh, couple came and contacted me. And, you know, it's just really great to hear about family members who are um, connected to people in the book as well. So we've done various exhibitions around the country from Belfast to Cork to uh, Galway to the Aran Islands. This is one we had in Spike Island in Cork, which is called Old Cork in Colour, where we took some of the pictures from the books and some pictures from Spike Island and basically did an exhibition around those. And uh, there's kind of various ones ongoing at the moment. Um, there's been a lot of debate, I suppose, on, in terms of should we colorize? And I suppose, you know, uh, people have different views. I, I, I think it's fair to say that the number of dissenting voices is, is quite small. But, um, you know, I, I kind of respect that people. Some people just think that the original is the original shouldn't be touched. Um, on the other hand, photographs have been colorized right since the very beginning of when photography started. You know, we're, going, we're talking about right back to the, the garotypes and tintypes. People were color, have been colorizing photographs. Uh, because people relate better to the colorized um, version. They connect with it. They see things that, you know, mirror their own lives. They, we also see things in, in color that we don't see in black and white. Um, you know, if you look at black and white picture and the colorized version, you'll often spot things that you didn't see. Just your eye kind of glosses over them sometimes, just the way our brains work, I guess, in black and white. Um, so I think there's various arguments for I'm, I'm the wrong person to be talking about why we shouldn't colorize. So that's not the talk you're going to get this evening. But there's lots of stuff you can find on that if, if, if you're interested in, in those arguments. But I do think the impact in terms of what it does, it makes people kind of appreciate um, their own photographs. So many people have been inspired to colorize their own photographs or even just figure out that something can be done with these old photographs. I, I, I had a phone call from somebody after Old Ireland Color came out saying, you know, I've got these boxes of, of um, glass plate negatives. They were thrown out onto a skip. I saved them. What do I do with them now? And it turned out they were the most fascinating pictures of shop fronts all around Munster. And I suggested they give them to the Tipperary um, uh, Digital Library and um, Tipperary Archives. And they have now digitized them. And very similar to the Prony project where they're showing the now and then, they've done that with these old shop fronts showing kind of now and then what they were like in the 1930s and what they're like now. And it's just been fascinating to kind of see this forgotten about a set of photographs, just getting a new life. So as I said to you, it's never going to be 100% accurate. You can only do your best. I have various works in progress where I'm trying to kind of, you know, uh, look for any kind of records whatsoever. I spend a lot of time on the Ellis Island travel records, trying to find eye colors and hair colors and anything that that that, um, that can help, I suppose, with colorization. Interviews, uh, newspaper accounts, um, paintings. Uh, I was doing a picture recently of, um, a famous Irish scientist and I managed to find some portrait paintings and I was very happy to be able to kind of match up. Actually, in the painting, I think the person was wearing the exact same suit as in the photograph I was trying to colorize because I could see the shirt and the tie were exactly the same. So uh, I looked out there and I was able to use those colors in, 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 in the colorization. So as I say, you'll never get exactly there, but you can, you're, you, at least you, you can feel a bit more confident that what you're creating is something that's in that direction. Um, and the ZDAI system is kind of a base layer that you paint on top of. I spend a lot of time in Photoshop 
you know, layering colors on top of colors and, you know, fine tuning um, the various aspects of, 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 of the picture. Here's an example. So this is a picture from Guidor. Uh, I've actually done a better version of this since, but just, just illustrative, I suppose, of what happens. So you've got the AI kind of picture on the top left, and then it kind of misses out on faces and arms and legs, and you kind of go through and you painstakingly, you know, are colorizing in pictures and faces, and you're superimposing that on, on the original picture to give you a better effect. And that's one of, you know, it could be five layers, it could be 100 layers, depending on how complex the picture is. Um, travel records, I mentioned this is this is a, a common thing I, I do in terms of looking for Liberty Island records. I was looking for um, uh, some of those people like uh, William Joyce, of course. I, William Joyce or Law Haha, while he would have traveled from the US, he was actually born in the US. Um, they only recorded the eye color and hair color of non-citizens, of aliens, as, as, as they're called in the record. So, you know, sometimes you, you kind of have to think about what you're looking for or know if you're going to find it or not. But this is um, uh, an Irish... Um, revolutionary he called himself the O'Reilly and I found two records of him traveling to the U.S. and uh where is he yeah he's line four here so it says he's got blue eyes and brown hair so that just helped with with colorization sometimes you'd be looking for multiple records because one person's interpretation of blue eyes is another person's interpretation of gray eyes you might be kind of averaging out across a number of records to see what the the commonality is but at least it gives you something in in, in that direction um a picture that would be well known to uh, prony people from Robert Welch's collection of the Titanic. And um, again, there are known records in terms of the obviously the chimney colors and, you know, paintings of, of the sister ships and so on. But even small details that I kind of found out in terms of the flag that was flown. So they were they were entitled to fly the blue ensign instead of the red ensign because of the military connections to the um, the, the crew on board. So the various things you're kind of trying to pick up in terms of um, making the colorization a bit, a bit more accurate. Um, so this is another picture actually from Northern Ireland and it's uh, Amelia Earhart when she landed, in, landed um, and I was actually fortunate enough to, to visit the plane in the Smithsonian a couple of years ago and I took this picture so I was able to use that for the, the colors of the propeller and the plane itself and so on and it's a, again a fascinating picture this one from the NLI. And staying with the plane team, this is uh, Lady Mary Heat, who originally hailed from Limerick. There are various records of her um, leopard uh, skin coats. And this picture was from a Dutch archive. So you know, there was a soldier here. And again, I kind of tried to figure out, well, who is this or what kind of outfit is it? And eventually I found a picture of a similar outfit of this um, Dutch soldier and was able to use those colors to um, colorize the picture. So any kind of hints you can find from the, the plane to the struts to you know, trying to figure out what kind of model plane it was. She had a number of planes at the time, so I was trying to see if there were any records on, on similar planes to use those for the colorization. And uh, again, it's never going to be perfect, but you're getting somewhat towards it. So uh, these pictures, again, from, from, from Prony as well, from the Straban floods. And um, I was talking to uh, Joy and Grace earlier on about the picture on the right. It's actually one that there's a, a now and then picture of, because there's another half that shows kind of the now. Um, but just two, again, pictures from that time. And uh, again, I, I think, the, especially the one on the left, when you see it in black and white and you see it in color, you know, especially the fact that you can see so many bare feet there, it does, res it does jump out a lot more. Your eye kind of tends to gloss over. You know, you see all these people, are, obviously, but I think when, when it's in color, when it's in black and white, you see a lot more faces in color for whatever reason, just the way, way, way the brain works. That's an experiment I think we'd have to carry out scientifically and see if we can... Uh, test that we'll do a test how many people can you see in this black and white picture how many people can you see in this color picture and we'll, we'll be able to prove that empirically but for now just take my word for it and this is another picture i did last year from prony and this is the beatles when they were playing in belfast and uh, again well we know lots of course about their hair color and john's red hair and so on but for me i was trying to find out well, what what guitar is this and what drum set is this and what color should the drums be drums are in some museum somewhere the guitars are somewhere else i was able to kind of find the colors for the various guitars and um and, and and drums and use those in the picture and in the background you know again in the black and white picture um i need to move my uh my zoom faces off the the, the right hand side of the screen here but you can see the person kind of ducking in behind the curtain so the black and white one it's you know you're again your eye kind of glasses over it and I ran through, through a couple of colorizers, which I'll show you later on, and they didn't seem to pick up on that. So you definitely have to have this human element where you kind of go through the picture and you spot stuff and you say, oh, that's what's going on there, or that's a bit of a hidden leg or whatever. Like those pictures I showed you of 
uh, Haw Haw and um, Brendan Bracken today. There was a load of those kind of little pieces of hidden jacket and leg that belong to another person. So you kind of really have to be on the ball in terms of making sure you're uh, you're picking up on, on those. And you'll always go back and look at a picture and say, oh, I missed that or I messed up on that and go and try and fix it. Um, this is a picture of my great grandfather. Now I haven't actually touched this up. I've run this through a new system called Palette, but uh, I, I put it in here because it's an example of where you would take something you would say, oh, I need to now go back and add any information I know. And we have some some oral history from family saying that he had a red beard and he doesn't have a red beard here, here in this picture. So he was the master of the Glenty's workhouse. He um, he went and trained uh, in, in Scotland, came back to, to Donegal and he, he started working this a very difficult uh, place to work as you can imagine all the workhouses were. But there's a picture of him and, and some of his family um, on, on the steps of the workhouse. And again, it's just a very striking picture. One that I, uh, you, you can see actually how, how I suppose how it's come even just running through an AI system, which is a, a state of the art one. Um, and certain things could be fine tuned, you know, flowers could be, these are, should be green obviously, and, and you know, the suits should be bluer and we know his beard should be red, but there's a lot that you can always do with these pictures, but it's a great starting point. So I've lots of links to, you know, Deoldify and so on, but if you, if you Google, uh, you know, Deoldify or Deoldify tutorial, I, I did a video on, on using the free version of Deoldify if you're interested in, in, in doing that. But I think colorization has become much more of a commodity that you can access in apps. Um, the various genealogy websites like Ancestry or MyHeritage have their own uh, colorizers. MyHeritage uses a commercial version of Deoldify, which is one of the state-of-the-art um, platforms available at the moment. Um, it's the one I use mostly for, for books one and two of, of All Iron and Color. And, um, the underlying code for the first version of the old file is open source, so people can take it, they can modify it, they can deploy it on their machines like I, I did um, on my PC at home. So there's lots that can be done there as well. Um, so I spend a lot of my time using, you know, this little pen and, and Wacom tablet here beside me for, you know, basically coloring and drawing and, you know, um, filling in colors in, in, in Photoshop. But a lot of stuff can be done for free in packages like GIMP, which is a free version of Photoshop uh, or free type of, um, Photoshop package. And then there's a various advanced tools you can get to do all kinds of image upscaling and enhancements and um, get lots of videos on YouTube in terms of how to colorize. That's how I learned originally myself in terms of colorizing. I watched a couple of YouTube videos uh, or tutorials online to figure out how to get going. The, um, the broader area, I suppose, of, of, of AI and, and images you know, there's so much happening. It, it's it's kind of hard to keep up or hard to kind of uh, adapt um, talks to talk about it. But I just thought I'd talk, mention a couple of things. There's a kind of a emerging practice, practice, especially in, in online, to tag images as being colorized. And you'll see systems like the Oldify, they add a little palette. Now we haven't, you know, in physical books like Old Iron Color, everybody knows it's a book of colorized images. So we haven't put these little palettes on it. But online, you'll see uh, sometimes people use this palette to tag an image is being colorized. So here's a picture of Elvis, black and white version, colorized version, enhanced version on the, on the right hand side. So the enhancement system is like Remini or Photoshop has its own enhance, enhancement system or Topaz. They basically, you know, sharpen up, you know, make hair more defined and so on, depending on the type of image and adds a little kind of magic wand to it. Um, so, you know, I think there's certain types of images that you know they were taken black and white and it's fairly obvious they've been colorized. So there's probably a kind of a gray area there around the when colorized pho photograph actually came in in terms of, well, was it taken in color originally or was it in black and white? Um, but then the whole uh, area of AI and images, I mentioned ChatGPT, the similar systems for creating imagery, those DALI, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, you can basically type in some text and create an image um, from a prompt. This is a similar type of thing. It's called This Person Does Not Exist, which basically generates random faces of people. And uh, I think if you were looking to create a whole set of fake social media profiles, you probably would be going to the site and generating. Every time you, re you re refresh the page, it generates a new random face. And they look, you know, they look real. Um, again, same kind of idea. It's learned from a big bank of images of faces, and it uses that to generate random real looking people. So we have all, all heard of deep fakes and all this kind of stuff. This is just kind of another thing in terms of what AI can do. Um, so I mentioned Deoldify, uh, two other systems for colorization, palette.fm, 
Uh, you can upload any picture there and download a low resolution colorized version for free. And you can pay then for higher resolution ones. I've been using this quite a bit recently as well as the Oldify. Um, now you can see in both this on the left-hand side and in uh, Photoshop, which has, has its own colorization system built in now in the new version, the little person in the back was missed out on in both cases, but you know that's just a small touch up afterwards. Um, so, okay, so I have lots of links. I already talked about these kind of uh, different types of platforms. You know, images can be enhanced. Videos can also be enhanced and colorized and upscaled. But I think it's important to think back to the originals and the the artifacts themselves. And you know, as long as you're able to obtain the originals in their original form, and and you know, in in all art and color. We always try and reference the original images either on social media we link to the original uh, source where the image came from or in the books we would obviously reference all of the uh, various libraries and archives who have kindly provided the images for, for the books it's also reignited in me an interest in preserving and you know um creating a kind of archive of images these ones are um from an archive i was talking to um joy and grace a little bit earlier on about um it's from um glass plate negatives I, I'm gradually scanning in from Northern Ireland and from Scotland and glass plate negatives are just the most fascinating uh, medium if you've ever encountered one they are just you know they're, they're the high definition images of, of the time there's just so much detail on them and um, uh, you can see a couple here actually there's unfortunately when, when I got them they came from a, an auction house in 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 in, uh, in England one or two got cracked along the way which I was very sad about so I, I scanned those in first um to make sure i had them and then gradually scanning in the rest of them but anyway you can see a few familiar scenes there and you know there's some metadata associated with them but unfortunately there'll be a lot of uh, um mystery work to be solved later on as well so i started to document i suppose my, my process in terms of going from um print or negative all the way through to Flickr or a site i use called omica and this is my own personal archive but you know with my ego i've called it the Breslin archive and um, I put a couple of hundred pictures up, up there already. You can um, browse uh, at, at your leisure and pleasure. And I'm hoping to do uh, you know, hundreds of thousands uh, more to, to, to scan and digitize. So um, gradually I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, but as the, the real archivists know, it's, it, it's a lot of work. And um, it's, um, but it, it's something that, that I, I think it's interesting to kind of come from the outside and have a look and try and figure out what's going on and see if you can kind of make it work while you know, all the while having this aim of, of just trying to uh, preserve as, as much as you can. Because, you know, as I said to you earlier on, so much stuff gets thrown out, so much stuff gets lost. Um, it's just, you know, valuable stuff to just, I think the more people do it, so, to do this, the better. So that's it from me. And um, I'm, you know, very happy to answer any questions or um, otherwise, either, you know, in, in here or, or afterwards, you can see my email address there. Feel free to drop in an email anytime. And I hope you found something interesting there in, in, in that talk. Um, and yeah, thanks again for, to Proni for the kind invite to, to, to uh, tell you a little bit about the background to the All Iron and Color project.